Um, okay, guys, uh, some interesting technologies to talk about here today. Um, but I just want to give a quick overview of who SpotX are and um, what we're about. SpotX are part of a, a group called the RTL Group, who are a big media organization. Um, their headquarters, the headquarters of SpotX themselves are actually in Denver and Colorado. We were recently bought by them. Um, and in Belfast, we've been operating for about the last uh, just over three years. Um, so that's grown from about three or four people initially to 30 people there with uh, four full stack development teams. Now, before you all run out, this is ad tech, right? No one likes watching ads, right? But it keeps the internet free, and it's actually really interesting to be actually working in from a technical point of view. Um, SpotX operate a platform globally. Um, we run over 2,000 production servers, which if you talk to Johnny, he just finds this the most amazing thing in the world. Um, and as a develop, development organization, we are very heavily, um, we have a very big engineering organization with about 200 developers. So what happens when you visit a web page um, that has a player in it and it puts that ad in front of you? What actually goes on there? I just want to briefly summarize. There is a nice uh, polished marketing explanation of this, but this kind of, I think, hopefully reflects it a bit better from a technical perspective. Basically, when you visit a web page, the player will make a request to SpotX's platform if you're one of the publishers that integrates with us, the likes of Spotify, the likes of Microsoft, or whoever it happens to be. On that request, we will have information about the device you're using, your location, your demographic, maybe some of your browsing history, or the referring URL that you are coming from. And when that hits our platform, our front, front end servers here, we call that an opportunity. And it's an opportunity for any advertiser that feels that that is their target audience to actually place a bid to actually impress their ad. So we'll compete that internally within our internal campaigns that are, or any advertisers that are already on our platform. And we'll also offer that out to other parties um, called demand-side platforms, or you can, you can think of them as just um, big advertising companies. Um, <coughs> so, as I say, basically the opportunity is competed internally, and it's also offered out, and we typically offer that out to maybe 10 other connecting parties. Essentially what happens after that, similar to what eBay would do in an auction, we run a real-time auction. And whoever wins that auction gets their ad sent back to the player. The ad, the ad will actually get loaded from like a content delivery network, but effectively, that's the auction process. When the first frame of the ad then starts to play, we will send an impression beacon back, or the player will send an impression beacon back to our platform. Those beacons will be sent back on the initial load at the 25th, 50th, 75th, and 100% quartiles in the ad. Now, as you can see, we have a whole range of of auction information that we gather here and a whole range of impression information that we gather here. So we need um, pretty robust systems to, to persist all this data. So there's a couple of things we're going to talk about here today. The two main ones are Hadoop and Druid. Um, everything here just gives an overview, a really, really high level overview of what happens in um, one ad call to impression. And this end to end transaction happens in 500 milliseconds typically. So it's very, very fast. And if I can just get you to think for a second, if you can just take every line in that diagram and imagine that as a HTTP transaction, and then imagine that this is one pixel, and this one pixel represents each of the lines you just saw in that diagram. This is now four million pixels, <coughs> and it represents the four million transactions that we handle every second on our platform. So you can, immediately start to get a sense of the amount of information that's gone through our platform, the amount of requests that are gone through our platform, and the level of data that we must be capturing in that platform. The infrastructure behind that, um, to, to support that, is obviously we have a lot of front-end servers that run all the auction, the auction software. We operate four data centers globally, which take 10 to 20 terabytes of data daily, and in total at the minute we have um, seven petabytes roughly in total storage, which is lots of 40-foot containers, basically. Um, auction servers, yeah, about a thousand odd auction servers running, and we operate a big data Druid cluster, or Druid and Hadoop cluster. So we have 200 node Hadoop cluster and Kafka servers, and over 75 um, node Druid cluster. So I'm going to hand you off to Jen now, who's going to talk briefly where we start to persist on that data in Hadoop. 
I'm not quite as polished as you, so I'm, I need notes. So, um, yeah, like you said, uh, Squadix deals with tons of data, um, and data that realistically can't be sorry, stored across multiple machines, uh, stored on one machine. Um, so I'm going to give you a really high-level uh, overview of Hadoop and what we use it for. So just to start with, um, I'm going to talk a bit about what distri distributed data is. And uh, distributed data is basically data stored across multiple machines in various locations linked by a network, and it provides us with three things. Uh, scalability, so spreading the load across multiple machines, and therefore to handle more data, uh, we just add more machines and we can reduce it as well if we need to. Uh, fault tolerance and high availability. So if a machine or a bunch of machines go down, which is a norm and uh, not an exception, others can take over. And automatic recovery from this is one of the core architectural goals of Hadoop. And finally, latency. Uh, like you said, uh, we, uh, Spotix currently has four data centers in the world. We have one in Singapore, one in Amsterdam, and two in the US. And in this way, users can be served from a data center that's geographically located next to them. Okay, so we have um, Hadoop, and H Hadoop provides us with three main things, uh, storage, processing, and speed. Uh, Hadoop is an Apache uh, open source software library and framework that allows for the distributed processing of large data sets across clusters of computers. And this data can be both in structured and unstructured formats. Um, and it's a cheap and scalable way to, s to process and store large quantities of data across these computers and usually at petabyte scale. And it allows us then to handle the massive amounts of data that we consume on a daily basis. Um, Hadoop comes with a number of uh, modules that are also open source, and one of these is HDFS. HDFS is uh, Hadoop's distributed file system, and it's a clustered file system which holds all of the data. So this cl cluster typically consists of two nodes. We have uh, the name node and the data nodes. The, the name node and data node are pieces of software designed to run on commodity hardware, and they're typically run in new Linux operating systems. Uh, the name node is uh, a master server which man manages the file system namespace, acts as a coordinator for the cluster, fulfills file system requests, so like keeping track of the number of copies of a file, changes to a file, and where they live. Uh, a HDF cluster typically has one name node, but operating in this kind of high, available, high availability mode allows for a second name node that acts as a, back a backup in case of failure. And the name node is also repo a repository for uh, HDF HDFS metadata. And the data nodes then are responsible for serving read and write requests from the file system clients. And uh, a HDFS cluster can ha have any number of data nodes. And then also since HDFS is built using the Java language, any machine that supports Java can run the name node, name node and data node software. Um, there's also a number of other uh, modules. One of these is Hive. Hive is actually a tool that was built by Facebook. And uh, it allows the user to query HDFS with, uh, with the SQL with a SQL-like query. Um, there is also Scoop, which is a tool that allows for the transfer between HDFS and relational data stores. Yarn, uh, which is a yet another resource negotiator, which accomplishes the scheduling of jobs and management of cluster resources. And Zookeeper finally provides coordination between nodes in a cluster. And this is only a small handful of the, the modules that Hadoop uh, provides. Um, so now, I can talk a little bit about what SpotX does with its data. We've invested in uh, open source big data technologies to bolster our core capabilities, like reporting and analytics. And we have tools which move our data into uh, Hadoop clusters. So um, we have processes that run at frequent intervals, like they would run every, every couple of minutes, and they create log files, and then were designed to be compressed and consumed by Hadoop. They're placed in HDFS, where they're replicated for fault tolerance and dis distributed processing. And now that it's actually in HDF HDFS, we can use it. And we, do, we use it for a number of different things. So we use uh, open source technologies like Spark to aggregate our data, which helps us to perform calculations for both internal use and for our customers or clients. We also export then from HDFS to look, MySQL, so it can be used by other applications. And we have uh, a number of our own uh, applications which we have built that can provide automated reporting for our customers. Um, so Hadoop obviously provides Spotix, a company like Spotix with a number of benefits. It, it provides us with huge amounts of storage, and like you said, currently over seven petabytes of data. It allows us to store everything at a really granular level. 
Um, it, it, it's the Hadoop uh, distributed computing model processes are the big data fast. So the more nodes that we use, the more processing power that we have, and we won't lose our data. Um, it's completely resilient. We'll still have access, um, and even if a node or two or three fails, we, we, we still have our data. Um, however, there are some cons uh, in that the query times it would be slower than we would like. There's extra effort required to maintain our clusters, and as different processing techniques have evolved over time, and we have more data, and we need to process it even faster, we have tried then to look into other open source option, options to tackle these problems. So, I'll hand it over to Ronnie. Okay, thanks, Jen. <coughs> so, the Jen point that sort of has gleaned, or you've gleaned from what Jen has said, Hadoop is damn complicated. And as a software engineer, look at like, if, how many people today have, haven't read about Hadoop before or haven't developed for Hadoop before? Good number of us, good, good, good. So, I would imagine a lot of you are looking at this going, what, how, what, uh, mm, okay. And walk away and sort of scratch your head and hope it's not too hard. But, as Ashlyn, Ashlyn as well had sort of mentioned earlier about uh, working on the, the shoulders of giants and Hadoop is a great example of that um, where we have uh, frameworks like uh, Apache Hive and Apache Spark to help us write programs to sort of query data in a higher level sort of way so that we don't have to worry about how we address 200 nodes in the cluster and how we do that in sort of a appreciable sort of quick time. So as a software developer, what do I need to think about when I'm looking at data on the dip? You know, first of all, we need to think, right, how's the data getting there in the first place? You know, is it been transferred, you know, one file to another. After all, Hadoop has a distributed file system. It's all built on files. Are the files just going whoop, whoop, whoop? Or is it a database connection? Am I hooking up to an Oracle database, MySQL database, or something else? Because then we have to think about the HTTP going back and forth, and, you know, if that's synchronous, blah, blah, blah. Is it an S3 bu bucket up on Amazon, like completely hosting the cloud? We have to pull it down from there. Or is it coming from Kafka, which is essentially a pub scrub sort of real-time feed? And Again, as I said, sort of Hive and Spark, you have a different ways of manipulating that data on the cluster. So what I'll start with is, so I've got here on the, on the left, uh, MapReduce, Spark, and Spark Streaming. So we'll start off with MapReduce. So MapReduce was sort of the original way of working with data on a cluster. So this MapReduce originally came out from Google when they could not throw enough money at uh, relational databases basically to make their data go faster. So they came up with this the idea of MapReduce, and that is best explained with a very simple sort of, well, it doesn't look simple, a very simple uh, word count kind of program. So let's say our data has come in, however that might have come in, and it has been split across the cluster. So in our data, we have uh, deers, bears, cars, and rivers, and we want to know how many are there in total in our cluster. So first of all, all this data is a run cluster, so we can't just, you know, track through one file, count it, job done. We first have to figure out, right, where is everything? So we first go to our mapping stage, which on each node that contains a file related to this data set, it will grab each key, so in this case, in our first node, we have deer, bear, and river, and it will assign a value of one. So then we have a lot of key value pairs across maybe 200 nodes in a cluster. We then need to organize our bears, cars, deers, and rivers to, so that we can count them. So that goes through a shuffle or sort stage. And this usually is the thing you want to try and streamline when you're writing code in a Hadoop cluster because if you imagine each of these lines is actually network I.O. going across a network. And if you have two to 500 servers sitting in a rack and I need to get to the rack over there, that's a lot of network I.O. So you need to keep it like a low level sort of idea of right, right, what am I doing with the data here? Is it going somewhere or is it going all the way? Once you have it organized, you then need to count them. And that's called the reduce stage. And this is typically where most programs will end, where you have two bears, three cars, two deers, two rivers, and that's presented back to whoever asked the question. Now, originally this on Hadoop was all done uh, basically on disk. So each time, when we store the data, when we map the data, when we shuffle the data and reduce the data, that's getting written to a hard disk somewhere, or 200 hard disks somewhere, and that's really, really slow. And that originally is what uh, Hive operated on, 
Hive, as Jens Rod mentioned earlier, is like an SQL based language. That's probably most suitable for developers who are coming from maybe a MySQL sort of based background so they can write some high level SQL and it'll do some crazy map just on the background. But you'll end up waiting maybe an hour or two for that to come back. So what came next was Apache Spark. And what Apache Spark tends to do in the background is follows that same model of MapReduce, but uses RAM as well. So it uses memory and cache. So instead of going through each stage, writing this, read from this, write from this, read from this, it can take advantage of the memory on these 200 nodes. So instead of you know using the, in our cluster, we, well, it's a seven petabyte cluster. So instead of using the, although shuffling through seven pet petabytes of data, we can then shuffle under RAM. And your typical job running on Hadoop might be using, let's say, 200 terabytes of RAM to run a program. And that's small, and it's kind of scary. So Spark can run up to 100 times faster in memory, uh, 10 times faster using disk and cache. And that's only because it optimizes a lot of stuff in the background. And the great thing for a developer is you suddenly don't need to worry what's going on in the background. Before, if you were to write a code for MapReduce, so say in Java, you have to write you know, functions to deal with every single stage of those things, and it gets really complicated, and you need to have a real good awareness of low level of what's going on. Whereas in Spark, it introduces this idea of resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs for short. And that means you can essentially treat your data as if it exists in one place, so as if it existed in one file. And you can apply counts, you can apply sorts, you can do whatever the hell you want and it only requires a few lines of code. So Spark is written in Scala, and so that's what we all write in, but you can also write in Java and also supports Python. So that's all well and good. So we got 100 times faster, and we're now, you know, we're getting down our queries or our batch jobs down to maybe half an hour, say, and we're getting good aggregations and things. But as you said, we get 4 million transactions per second, and we would like to know sometime this century, you know, how our technologies are performing. So we use call a thing called a Spark Streaming. So Spark Streaming, obviously built on top of the Spark Engine, will take a real-time data stream. So let's say, for example, that's our 4 million data points coming in every second. And it could come through Kafka. It could come through any sort of buffer. And what that does is you will batch the data into maybe seconds, or five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever, and treat them, treat them as that RDD that I talked about earlier. So as far as the developer is concerned, I'm still writing about one file, I'm aggregating blah, 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 but what you're actually doing is maybe spinning off millions of jobs for every second that you're getting the data in. <coughs> and what this allows us to do is sort of aggregate that stuff up as it's coming in, get a quicker real-time insight. Now, it's not true real-time, because true real-time would be data in, data out, whereas we're called data in five seconds later, data out. And even now, Spark is looking to go into more continuous stream processing, but so experimental stage is a little bit off. So what we've had to do to sort of get more of a real-time aggregation is to go into, uh, into other open source technologies like Druid, which hopefully he was going to tell you a little about a bit now. Okay, um, can everybody hear me okay? Hopefully. Apart from anybody from Spotix, has anybody else here heard of Druid yet? Okay, cool, couple, awesome. Okay, it's class, <laughs> right? Um, but what is it? Well, it's a high performance column oriented distributed data store, and that's what Druid call it on their website. I'm not convinced that it really gives a true reflection of how class it actually is. It, it essentially allows you to aggregate data when you write the data to it. Now, I know aggregating data on ingestion is nothing new. We do, we've done it in Hadoop in the past. We've built aggregates to try and uh, increase query performance. But doing it in a distributed nature and making it available in a really fast way um, is something that Druid excels at. And how does it work, sir? What, what are the key features of it? So the questions that you want to ask Hadoop, you, ask, you can ask the same questions of Druid and Hadoop will give you um, your answer maybe in a, a couple of hours or at least 30 minutes for a typical Hadoop query based on the complexity. 
Druid, on the other hand, will respond with the same um, answer in milliseconds. And in addition to that, it's scalable. It hand handles trillions of events and petabytes of data, um, and it has support for real-time streaming. I think they're probably the, the key things I would highlight about that, along with the fact that it's actually um, also an open source project that's pending adoption by the Apache Software Foundation. So how does it work, or what way does it, how does it manage to be so much quicker and give you the same answers? Well, if you look at a traditional database, like Hadoop or MySQL, it might represent um, information like this in a big table. Every time it gets an entry, it inserts it. Druid is effectively doing something similar, except it stores all this information in a columnar form. And every time it gets an, an, a unique value for something, it creates a bitmap. Every time it gets a repeat value of that, it just adds to the bitmap. So it means that when you go to query it, you can basically just look up the bitmap and return everything with a value of one, and it, it means that it responds super, super fast. It provides support for dimensions that you can slice and dice, and metrics for aggregating. So typically in our world, we'll, we'll look and we will look at things like um, iPhone users in USA and Denver, and if I wanted to, to know how many people we had in our system, how many impressions we gleaned there, I can ask that question of Druid, and it'll respond really quickly, or I can go to Hadoop, get the same answer, It'll give me every single time in the day that that happened, but um, it takes a longer time to respond. So what is it, where is it really good and what is it really bad at? There has to be some sort of give and take here. Compression aggregation, obviously, as you can see by the information that's refre ref reflected here, um, compression levels are outstanding. Um, query responsiveness is awesome. It's also got a modular architecture, so you can actually um, contribute to this project. You can build your own custom modules. Um, one of the guys, Adam, here has actually built an emitter to emit stats from Druid into InfluxDB. Um, and we're going to try and get that fed back in the open source community. And it also provides um, login and really good um, login and really good metrics for giving an overview of its actual cluster state. There are some trade-offs when you go to use Druid. So when we aggregate the data, we are going to lose granularity. And that means that Although I can answer the same question in terms of how many iPhone users in Denver that I have in the last hour, I can't tell you the points in the hour that they were hitting our system. It also doesn't have support for true SQL style joins. It has a notation of a lookup, but it's not like a traditional join that you can join on different data sources. And Druid really isn't designed for things of high cardinality. So something like a, a grid reference point or a postcode that you will generally find um, unique will not roll up, they won't aggregate, so that actually is a limitation, or it's not really designed for it. The key nodes in its architecture, so at the heart of a Druid cluster, um, sits Apache Zookeeper, and it's basically a registry for what nodes live where, um, and these are the key nodes that I think make up, or the, the, the most important nodes in a, in a Druid setup. So we have indexer nodes, and they're responsible basically for reading data in via stream or via file, and they, they're basically the the nodes that are responsible for ingesting the data, rolling it up, and after a certain time, they'll hand that off to historical nodes where our data is generally persisted. We in SpotX use Hadoop as a deep storage store, which is if we ever lose data in historicals, we can always pull it back out of, out of Hadoop again. How do we access the data? Well, there's also broker nodes, and these broker nodes are basically just form a, an API to um, go and query the historical nodes. So given the fact that it's a modular architecture, also that, that um, it's got different specialist nodes, you can actually scale these nodes up and down depending on your, um, your load on whatever particular part of the system you're getting it. Um, and I just wanted to finish with where the technologies we've talked today actually fit in at SpotX and one of the projects that I've actually been, actually been working on over the last while. Are we okay for time here, Johnny? Right, sweet. Um, okay, so the guys have mentioned Kafka. Kafka is just, you can just think of it as a big print buffer, big distributed print buffer. We basically put all the data that I had mentioned at the very start of this presentation onto this big print buffer, and we dump it into Hadoop. We also read it in real time, or near real time, into Druid. And what does that, what does that let us do? Well, the project I'm working on at the minute um, is called Forecasting, and what we're trying to do in as near real time as possible is go and if an, and, and answer the question, if, if I was to go today and I want to target iPhone users in Belfast at five pounds per million clicks, how many advertisers am I actually, or how many people can I actually hit? And what we can actually do at that time is 
we can make a request through a forecast API, which will go and look up all of the historical data that we've had for that trend in the past, take that data in near real time, and put a trend um, on, that, on that using a library um, developed by Facebook called Profit. So that basically allows us to you know, try and look at predictive um, impression counts and ad request counts, um, and hopefully let our advertisers and publishers earn more money, basically. Um, I mentioned the module that um, Adam had written. This is something that we want to contribute back to the open source community and do it if we can. Um, and it basically allows us to monitor the state of the cluster. So if our, any of our ingestion tasks um, fail or data isn't replicated properly, we hopefully have a, an overview of how, how or where that's went wrong. Um, and just as a company to finish with this slide, um, this is all of the open source, or the majority of the open source technologies that we use on a daily basis in SpotX. It allows us to deliver releases daily um, into our production platform and hopefully gives you a good insight into how useful this stuff is. So I think that's all we have, unless you guys have any questions.